I'm NIG, uh, I'm on the select board. I'm also a vice chair of the fire station building committee. Don Rand, the chair of the fire station building committee, should be here any minute now. Uh, Chief has asked me to, to start the meeting in her absence, so we will call this meeting to order because we are at a meeting tonight, so we can discuss stuff. Um, the first item on our agenda, members of the committee, is approval of minutes, which we will be passing over and do it at our next regular meeting. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to hear from the architects. Uh, they're going to give a presentation as to where they are right now with the process. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will take questions and, and please think of good questions, ideas, everything else. This meeting exists for public input and I'm really excited to have a really good turnout tonight. A lot of, a lot of people and, um, from all, all walks of life. So this is really good. Um, at this point, unless anybody has any objections, I'll just simply turn it over to our experts. You want to see if we can turn it on? Yes. Yeah. 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 Sure. We can probably figure that out now. Which ones? I don't know. Ah, how about this? And the... Hey, there we go. Okay. You want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Amy Dunlap. I'm a principal with HKT Architects. And I'm here with Janet Slamenda, who's also a principal at HKT, and Mark Tice, who is the project architect working on this project. Um, thank you for uh, all coming, and it's great to see such a great turnout on this night. Um, I'm just going to bring you up to speed on the process that we've been going through um, since the last community meeting. I, I recognize some of the faces from the first community meeting that we had. Um, community session number one back in October. Um, it's great to see you back here again. Uh, since then we've been doing a lot of work. Uh, we've had a lot of meetings. We had a, a meeting with the select board uh, back in November to give them an update on uh, where we were in the design process at that point in time. We had a joint um, listening session with the master planning committee and the design review committee um, and the uh, fire station building committee where we talked to them about um, where we were in the study, we reviewed the process, and then we also talked about precedence. Um, as architects, a lot of time we look for precedence within a community, what other buildings are within a community, what are other communities building, uh, so that we can get ideas, we can uh, sort of gauge uh, where our design uh, matches up with others and uh, move forward with uh, the design process. And we had a nice, lively discussion at that time and um, look forward to continuing that tonight. Um, we've had lots of committee meetings, and at every committee meeting we presented the design as it was at that point. Uh, we've uh, had a number of votes on uh, where we were going to go forward, and then we progressed the design to the next point. Um, so those uh, have been happening fairly regularly, every couple of weeks probably, um, and we have a, a schedule uh, for that moving forward through the rest of schematic design. Right now we're in the phase called schematic design, which is the time when we design the building, uh, come up with big picture ideas, then we move on into design development where we really develop the details. Um, and the, the design gets more set at that point, gets a little bit more difficult to make changes because we're really bringing the engineers in, we're bringing the rest of the design team in, really honing in on the details before we move into the construction document space, which is getting a set of, uh, of drawings and specifications ready for public bid with uh, contractors who are gonna put pricing to it. Um, and compete for the, the project. Um, so, as I say, we're in schematic design right now, so things are still a little bit flexible, and you'll see where we are as we go through the meeting. We'll talk about the design process, and sh I'll show you the concept that we've developed to date, and then we'll talk a little bit about the next steps. So, this is just a big picture uh, description of uh, our design process and how we approach it. Um, the first step in any design is to develop a program we have a lot of in-depth meetings with the fire department, the chief, the deputy, other firefighters. We go and visit their fire station and see what they have now. Uh, we do a lot of fire station designs and what we found over the years is that a lot of the pieces from one fire station to another are the same, but the operations, the way they actually work is different from community to community. The equipment they have, the apparatus, they have the trucks, the boats. Those things are all different from community to community. So we really have to talk to them and get to know how they function, how their workflow is, how do they envision that happening in a new station. And as we do that, we develop a list of spaces that will go in the new station. We approximate what the square footage will be. We talk about what kind of equipment's gonna go into those spaces. And that gives us the groundwork as we develop a plan moving forward. 
Um, we look at the context. Um, that's the precedence that I was talking to you about. We look at the neighboring buildings, town buildings, everything else that's in a community that makes your community what it is. Um, again, every community is a little bit different and the architecture of every community is different. We think it's really important that whatever we build fits in with your community uh, nicely and so those precedent studies are really important as we start the design process. And then we start to develop these plans that support the operations. As I say, the programming is key. That leads into the plans that really support the operations for the fire department. And during that phase, there's a lot of back and forth. We put a plan in front of the building committee and the fire department. The fire department reacts. Um, they get to see those early conversations that we had, how they manifest themselves into a plan. And they get to have some feedback and say, you know, we thought this would work, but now that we see that, we want to change this a little bit. And we, um, we adapt to that, we um, develop the plans and, and make the changes as we go along. And then we start to look at the building forms. How is this going to look three-dimensionally? And develop the elevations and the building forms. From there, we look at building materials. Is it going to be brick? Is it going to be something else? And we look at sustainability. Um, we, it's really important to us that we don't do architecture that, that matches another community. It's not cookie cutter. It's unique to your community and that everything that we do supports the function and the operations of the fire department. That is key uh, to getting a successful building that's gonna work for them, make sure that um, they can do their job um, safely and effectively. So. Yeah. Um, so these are some of the precedents. When we met with the, the joint um, committee, we showed a lot of precedents, um, and we're just showing you a few from that presentation. Um, we looked at uh, industrial and commercial buildings that you have in town. All the different forms that they take, the different materials that they take, the different window patterns. Uh, we looked at uh, the library, the town offices, other public buildings. Again, um, you know, they're from different eras, they have different materials, they have different languages to them, but this is what you have in your town and it's important to um, understand that context. Other public buildings we looked at, the senior center, the police department, um, these are just a few of the schools in town, but we looked at those, um, again, there are flat roofs, there are pitched roofs, there are arches, there are columns, there's all different kinds of things that we looked at, we talked about uh, with the committee as we were moving forward with the design. And then we looked at the, uh, the fire stations, the fire station that the department is in right now and the old fire station uh, that they were in uh, before the, the, um, the current fire station was built, um, and the old town hall. Um, in the downtown, um, the way it looks now. And then we, we went back and found historic photos to see, um, or historic drawings to see what it looked like uh, when it was built and the, the different um, proportions and, and color changes and palette that were in place at that point in time. And then um, in, in the, um, these are just some other different uh, structures that we saw. You know, in the fire station, one of the things we have in the program is a, a training and hose tower. And so we looked at different vertical elements that you have in town, um, monuments, uh, church steeples, um, to get an idea of how uh, those were handled, the proportions, the material changes, um, and then the, the aqueduct, the great arches in that. And then elements in your streetscape, entrances, plantings, fencings, uh, benches, again, all these things that um, you interact with on a daily basis as you're moving through the downtown area. Um, there, here is um, the uh, landscape design and we'll give you an idea of what's going on with the site design. These are all uh, still schematic, we're still a work in progress, but this is where we've settled at this point in time. Um, we have, um, so just to, to give you some context here, this is Main Street right here, and then this uh, is going up back to the hill. There's a bank right here on the corner. Dunkin Donuts is across the street over here. Uh, we have divided uh, the site um, with separate parking to promote safety. Uh, the public would come in this side over here. All the public parking is on this side of the building. The fire department personnel parking is on this side of the building. And that's really to promote safety uh, so that the fire department personnel are coming in near where the apparatus might be going out and the public is kept sort of separate from that, um, a safe distance away from emergency uh, response traffic. We have, uh, right now, we have 23 um, staff parking uh, spaces over on this area, and then 30 guest um, parking spaces on this area. 
Um, if you've been out to the site, you know that there's a substantial hill going up uh, behind the building. And we do have a retaining wall that's going to wrap around the parking areas to hold that, that earth back. And we're looking at different design options for that at this time. Um, the planting designs that we've uh, developed has a lot of low um, species in the front of the building to promote safety. Again, as the apparatus is coming out here, we want them to be able to see and have good sight lines going down West Main Street, or down West Main Street as they come out. Um, so we don't want to have any trees that obscure any views there. So we're talking to the landscape architect about having some, some uh, nice low uh, plantings in that area. Everything we do is really to support operations. So the building is set back from the street and that distance is determined by the depth that you need for an apron here. That allows uh, trucks that are returning to pull in to the apron and then back into the station without having to get out into the street and back in in the middle of traffic and hold traffic back. So that really determines the depth that you push the building back from the street. And again, it's all about safety and to make sure that um, it's safe for the, the firefighters returning and it's safe for the public driving by. And this is the floor plan. We've looked at a few different options with the committee and this is uh, what we've settled on. It's a two-story um, scheme. The arrow here shows where the main entrance is into the building. Uh, you enter into a vestibule here with a lobby space. Um, and that would have a window connecting to the fire department administrator uh, so that she could interact with the public there. This whole blue zone is sort of the, the public area. We have uh, the training and EOC room here with public toilets and a little kitchenette um, that's easy access off the lobby without having to get back into the secured areas of the fire station. The um, sort of pinkish, purplish area back here is all fire department administration. So that's where the chief's office is, the deputy's office, conference rooms, uh, shared offices for other firefighters, as well as support spaces, some storage, copy rooms, things like that. And then this uh, pink area is all uh, fire operations. Um, you see we have um, the uh, six bays for the uh, fire apparatus here. Um, in most of the bays, they are parked either three vehicles deep or in cases of uh, the larger equipment, like the ladder truck here, there are two vehicles deep. There are doors on both the front of the station and the back of the station, so trucks can come and go in both directions. And then we have support spaces on either side. Um, these are some storage spaces, some places where they, uh, they put their um, tanks for filling um, SCBA, the um, air tanks that they use uh, when they're fighting fires. And then in this middle zone here, there are a number of support spaces as well as decontamination spaces. When the firefighters come back from a fire, they can have contaminants on their gear and on their bodies. And so it's really important that we provide a place where they can get inside, they can get their gear off, get that into um, a, a gear washing and drying uh, facilities, and they can also get into showers so that they can shower, clean their bodies, get those contaminants and carcinogens off of their bodies before they head into the rest of the station. So we've worked really closely with the department to come up with a, a, a flow that matches their operations and that will allow them to do all of that before they, they leave this space and either um, come up the stair to get up into the living quarters or uh, enter into the administration spaces over here. Um, we also have uh, plumbing, fire protection, and electrical services all located on exterior walls. Um, with doors out to the exterior where we need them, and, um, and uh, um, there are opportunities. There's a um, hose and training tower um, that we talked about before on the front of the building, which gives the, the fire department opportunities for training there. Um, on the second floor is where the firefighters live when they're in the station. There's a series of uh, dormitory spaces in the front of the building here. Uh, with areas for uh, lockers right outside the dorm rooms, which is a nice feature so that when uh, one firefighter is in the room, if another firefighter comes in, they're able to store their gear without um, um, disturbing them um, while they're in the room. There's uh, living quarters, the day room, and the kitchen are back here with access out to a roof deck where they can have a barbecue, outdoor eating areas. We have toilets and, and shower rooms in the core of the building as well as a fitness and then a number of mechanical spaces here. This is uh, the apparatus bay on the lower level. It's a, it's a high two-story space there, so there's nothing on this floor plan there. 
but we do have uh, a mezzanine space over on this side of the building where they can store um, large equipment and they can also uh, do have training exercises up there. Things like rappelling down um, this wall, they can practice there. Um, a number of different uh, training activities can happen there. Um, so again, these are just uh, some uh, neighboring businesses. Um, what our context really is in the immediate vicinity of the fire station. Um, you see the Dunkin' Donuts that's across the street, the bank that's next door. Uh, we're not very far from the Old Town Hall. These are the context types of things that we look at as we start the design. And this little drawing shows you, gives you an idea of the scale of the fire station that we're talking about in comparison to some of those buildings. So um, this is um, an early diagram of a flat elevation of the fire station and you can see how much bigger it is compared to some of these other buildings um, nearby. The Old Town Hall is, is considerably taller, but um, the overall length of the building is, is much larger than the other things. So that's one of the things that we are looking at as we're developing the design, is how can we break down that facade to uh, work with the surrounding uh, What structures. is the length of the building? I think we're going to hold on yeah, questions no. until the you end. Hold all your questions to the end, because we need to move the mic up so we can hear you. Question. You won't write it down. I'll write it down for you. Janet, can you So this is the um, elevation along uh, Main Street. As we've developed it at this point, we're looking at a masonry building uh, to fit in with a number of other masonry structures in town. Uh, there was a, a lot of keen interest both from the committee, the fire department, and some of the um, folks that we talked to in the joint committee about incorporating arches into the design. So we worked really hard to come up with some different options uh, for that, and this is what the, the committee selected. Uh, the main entrance is located right here uh, with a nice arch to highlight that. There are um, as a nice glassy front here so that you can see that an, an antique um, hand tub that uh, the fire department owns that would be stored in the lobby on display. Uh, the uh, training room has a number of windows down here to allow light and views into that spaces. And then um, we have those arches repeated over the apparatus bay doors. Um, and then uh, you see the hose tower element. Uh, we are looking at putting a clock here, uh, which would be a nice um, municipal uh, element to add to the street along uh, Main Street. And uh, we have incorporated some masonry uh, banding that um, picks up the line of the arch and then continues around the building to sort of bring all of these different elements together um, into a unified design. And as I, I'm going to show you a couple of views from one direction or another. So this is coming from uh, the downtown area heading out of town down Main Street. This is what you'd see. You'd see the side of the apparatus bays along here, the parking back here, you can see the retaining wall behind, and then from the other direction heading into the town, um, you see the station here. This is, as you're heading into town, um, the side view, this is uh, the training room, we'll have another exit for egress purposes coming out of the training room there, uh, dorm rooms up on the upper level, um, and uh, the um, the day room kitchen here, and then these are into several offices. This is from the back parking lot area, from the public parking lot area, looking back toward the building. Again, these are a number of offices, uh, the day room, dorm rooms up here. This is that flat elevation that you see on the other side of the apparatus space. So this is the um, east wall that you would see um, as you're heading out of town. And then this is the uh, back elevation behind the building um, in the parking lot areas. Again, we're carrying some of that banding around. We have a number of spaces back here that really um, don't necessarily need access to windows, electrical rooms, storage rooms. Uh, this is actually the teaching, we call it the teaching wall of the uh, training and EOC room. It's a, it's a wall much like this where there would be a display screen or a monitor. Um, you don't really want to have windows on that space. Um, for functional reasons and operations. Um, and then we are the we have the six bay doors that are coming out the back of the building here as well. 
Uh, one of the things we're looking at is whether or not we do the arches on the back side of the building. Uh, in this scheme, we're showing uh, no arches in the back side of the building. It's, a, it's uh, really a cost element, something that we'll be talking to the committee about a little bit more. And this is that back corner um, from the uh, fire department parking area looking toward the building. So the next steps after this meeting, uh, we do have a meeting next week with the Design Review Committee. We'll be presenting um, this information uh, pretty much in, and uh, our engineers, our civil engineers, our landscape architects will also be there to answer any questions. We have ongoing committee meetings as we move through the design process. Um, we have uh, a lot of um, engineering that's starting right now, as I say, so the next step will be to get that engineering pulled together for schematic design so that we can get a package to a cost estimator who will look at the design that we proposed and, and give us an idea of what the cost will be for this building. We really haven't done any of that yet. Um, it's uh, not until we get that preliminary engineering done that we can really even start to talk about cost. So that will be a, a key point towards the end uh, of this month, beginning of next month that we get uh, that cost estimate done and see where things are. And then from there, we move into design development. As you say, we start to really narrow down these details, um, figure out how the building is going to get built, put that information down, and we'll be continuing on with the permitting process meeting with the design review committee, the planning board, the zoning board, and continuing our meetings with the community to keep you apprised and answer any questions that you might have. So one of the things that ha uh, happened in a previous uh, public input meeting is we had a very difficult time with the minutes because people, number one, didn't identify who they were and then didn't identify their address. As you know, that's a requirement of any open meeting. So what we're going to do this time is we're going to put up uh, the mic here. Whoever wants to speak can come up to the mic, identify yourselves, your address, give your question. Members of the board are going to try to answer along with the architects. Madam Chair, that you're here, do you have any questions or any? Yes, Any questions from the board before we open it up to the public? It's width of the building. <laughs> <laughs> I have my notes. It's 233 feet um, long along Main Street and then 114 feet deep into the site. 230? 233. What was the math again? 114. That's the max. Plus or minus. <laughs> okay. So we'll open it up to the public. Um, as the chief said, you're welcome to stand and you'll identify yourself and your address before you ask your question. If you don't want to go to the stand, go ahead. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good. We won't need a mic. Name and address. Thanks. I, I, I know it. <laughs> I have to deal with the person taking a minute. I don't want to get yelled at. <laughs> Give Chase six Kibble Lane. Listen, I, I have several questions. Uh, and I'm a supporter of the new, new fire, fire station. I was in town when the old one came down and the, uh, the new one was built. I know we had pretty much a volunteer staff at the time and there are uh, shortcomings on safety and health measures and uh, standards and uh, also on personnel of different sexes that needed to be accommodated for. Uh, however, I also have a concern over the, uh, the cost, the overall cost to the taxpayer of just about everything and anything that's been, been uh, getting approved here in town, and this is a big item. I have not seen a cost breakdown on uh, this entire uh, proposal yet, and I think it's really going to be premature. I would hate to see this come up on a, a town meeting uh, warrant uh, before we have a whole breakdown on uh, what this building is going to cost. Uh, the retaining wall that we were told initially that uh, we wouldn't need it, that they were going to do a surgical cow out on, on this hill, and we, you know, now it's 30 feet high, or uh, we're going to have a Fenway Park uh, uh, wall behind there, retaining wall. I don't know how far the distance is to the water tank. That's a concern uh, in any kind of an emergency condition with climate change coming up and a lot of heavy rains, if you look at the 
adjacent property, uh, Hillside Grill, you can see a lot of erosion there already and rocks coming down, been coming down for years. So um, the price of that, uh, uh, the overall price of the uh, uh, architectural drawings. And I don't know the difference in the layout between what we discussed in 2019 and now. And the picture that you showed, uh, I'm not sure, you, you know, you, you talked about uh, staying functional, trying to keep everything functional, and I was hoping that would include the building as well. I, I, I don't, I don't, I hate to sound like a, an old guy just sounding off on stuff here. I don't know the reason why the clock tower. I would expect that any hiring of fire personnel that these boys will know how to tell time and have a watch, and if they don't, they can look at the location of the sun. But, I, you know, that clock tower, that's going to cost quite a bit just for a clock tower. And I'm not sure it's needed. You know, I, I like to see a functional building with all of the features that the state and the safety and health stuff requires, but I, you know, I. I don't want to see excess of spending to make something look good and different. And I don't see that the clock tower actually matches any of the old buildings in the town as it is, uh, quite frankly. And I, and I, I mean that in a nice way. I know we were trying to do a job and, it, and it, you know, it, uh, maybe if things were different and prices of material and everything else weren't so expensive, it would, it would you know, be okay, but right now I think anything that's proposed here for this fire building, we need to get a whole good breakdown and idea of what all of this does. You know, and I, and I, uh, I just mean that in the sincerest way possible. Uh, before it goes before the people, we gotta look to see what it's gonna cost in addition to taxes, property taxes, and that's another big, big issue. Uh, I'll think of more. Okay, to answer your question, before it goes to town meeting, there will be a breakdown of prices. There will go to town meeting. Well, it's been prices. five years, isn't it? Well, it can't go to town meeting yeah. either. So. You better, you better start getting this down. Well, you got all this stuff. We're trying to get it down. <laughs> the architects will assure you that we can't go to town meeting without a price. We can't go with one check. Um, the clock tower, maybe you can address a little better. Yeah, I think it's, um, oops. Sorry, wrong way. I'm going to go back because I think it's important to understand that it's it's not really a clock tower. It is a training tower and a hose tower that just happens to have a clock on it. It's, um, a, it's a what? It's a training and hose tower that just happens to have a clock on it. Oh. Chief, do you want to talk about the hoses sure. a little bit? So uh, I think it's, it's a great great question, a great time for me to answer some of the concerns with the hose tower training tower. So. First and foremost, it's a training tower. It allows us to uh, stretch holes up, up the stairs uh, without having to worry about putting holes in the walls because I can tell you the firefighters are going to put holes in the walls when they go up because they have their air packs on, they have the gear on, right? So it gives us a nice training location for that, uh, which uh, we will put uh, what's called a fire department connections, hose tower connections in there so the firefighters can simulate taking dry hose up, tying them in, charging the lines, we don't have to worry about it getting wet because it's built for that reason. So. That's one of the big reasons for it. Another reason for it is, and, and people are gonna tell you, well, modern fire hose doesn't need to be dry. Well, let me try to clarify some of the information that's out there. When I first started back in the dark ages, you were before me, but uh, all fire hose was cotton duck. And if you didn't dry it, it got really yucky, musty, moldy, disgusting, right? So they started coming out with rubber jacketed hose and they started coming out with 100% polyester hose. And one of the marketing things that the salespeople would do is, you don't have to, you don't have to wash this. You don't, you don't have to wash, you don't have to dry it. Still wash it, you don't have to dry it. But when you go onto every one of their sites, you know what the first thing it says about maintenance is, is do not store the hose wet. But you don't have to dry it. Okay, so we do dry it. We also use it, if you guys recall, just about a year ago we had a pretty significant fire in town. It was minus 14 degrees that night. And when we came back to the station, we had, I don't know guys, how much hose? A significant amount of hose 
it was frozen. The only thing to do with that hose is to hang it in the towel till it thaws, then pull it down, then wash it, then hang it back up and dry it. We also work in the Northeast, putting wet hose on the truck and going out when it's 18 degrees and when we're running call after call is not really a good thing to do. We need that hose to be able to deploy quickly and easily and not cause problems. We also use hose towers for drying tarps because we use lots of tarps in our truck. We also use hose towers for drying ropes. So we put a lot of ropes in there. So any different time of the day you go in there, it's also where we store our spare hose. You know, you don't find this in New Hampshire or Maine. Yeah, you do. Where? Uh, my stations I worked at before, I had hose towers in both of them in New Hampshire. In Portsmouth? Uh, I have no idea. Portsmouth has yeah, multiple stations, and I'm sure they yeah, have a hose tower. Not, 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 yeah, they do. You know, uh, All over the place. They do? Yeah. I, I worked in Merrimack, I had a hose tower in Merrimack. I was a chief in Belmont, I had a hose tower in Belmont. I can understand what you're saying, but boy, I haven't seen it. Uh, Westboro doesn't have one. No, Westboro doesn't. You know what they do with the hose? Perhaps they doesn't. They put it all over the floor. And so that's so, what we've been doing here, right? No, we put it in a hose tower. We have a hose tower. Where, where is that? The hose tower is right behind the station. We have a hose oh, tower where we are now. Okay. We utilize it all the time. Okay, all right. So it's, and, and you're, you're going to get just like any, any business, if you ask the cop what's the best gun to carry, half of them will say automatics, half of them will say revolvers, right? Same thing with police, or same thing with fire. Some will say, yeah, you need hose towers. Some will say, no, no you don't. Uh, the majority of officers I've talked to in my district either want hose towers and don't have them, or have them and utilize them. They're not required. Then if you read NFPA 1962, which is the maintenance requirement for hose, it says you do not store hose wet. You need to dry it. You gotta dry the it ways somewhere. to dry the hose is you can dry it by laying it out accordion style on the floor, which doesn't work because now you have a trip hazard everywhere. It's not a good thing to do. Or you buy very expensive, not very effective hose dryers that dry probably five lengths of hose at a time. Well, five lengths of hose is nothing, right? It would take us forever to dry that. And they're expensive, they use a lot of electricity. Just not a way to go. So the most efficient way to do it is to hang the hose, let it dry when it's done, pull it down, roll it up, and put it away. Well, in a perfect world, if, if it makes sense, if, if you know you have the money, but where your the economy is such, the income is not keeping up with expenses, uh, taxes are, are sky high, and service costs and everything in these municipality mm -hmm. levels are increasing all the time. How do you, you know, so, so based on that comment, based, based on that comment, I would rather dry the hose in a hose tower than buy new hose every five to 10 years, because it's expensive. I don't doubt that. Right, so it makes a lot more sense to take what the town gives us, the fire trucks they give us, the hose they give us, the equipment they give us, the turnout gear they give us, and take care of it, maintain it, hang it to dry, put it away clean and, and secure, so it'll last us, we have hose, See, all this hose we have, probably in the 80s? Uh, no, like not quite. We have, I thought we had the ones from 86. Early 90s. Early 90s, <laughs> right? So we try to make it last as long as possible. Well, now it's one of the other reasons good. we're doing it. Yep. Okay. More questions? Yes. Uh, Ron Doucette, 29 St. James Drive. Uh, what do you anticipate the future growth and development in Northborough so that the fire station will be built to accommodate the future growth? So Ron, the footprint on the right has expanded capabilities for staff that we don't have today. That's number one. Expectation in the future is, is that the, the staff of, of the fire service will, will increase. Uh, so there's there's room for accommodation of that, as well as the equipment base uh, from there. And the central location of this will enable the fire service to get to all parts of town on Main Street, east or west, in terms of central location. And I'll let the chief talk about some of the requirements the town has relative to responsiveness to, to, to fires. So once we when we designed it, when we sat down with uh, the architect team. Actually, before we sat down with the architect team, they gave us a piece of paper with a ton of questions, which I sent out to the entire department. And it said, where do you see your staffing in five years, 10 years, 15 years, all the way out to 40 years? 
Now, I've been doing this for a long time. I can tell you, 40 years ago, I never would have anticipated the size of equipment we have, the jobs that we do, uh, hazardous material, rescue, EMS. Because when I get in, I mean, EMS was, we didn't talk to them. They, they were over there. They were special people. But now, uh, we, 68, 67% of our stuff we do is EMS. So what we do is we have to try and estimate. So we estimated going out 40 years what our staffing was going to be. We built that to accommodate that staff. Okay. Okay. We try to estimate what's going to happen with apparatus. We built the apparatus bay with the idea they may get bigger, they may get heavier, and they may be, there may be more things that have to do with it. We did the training aspects with it. We're thinking, okay, is training going to change? What's our mission going to do? Are we going to be doing more, more tech rescue, more repelling than we do now? If we do that, we're going to need areas to train. That was considered when we designed the station. So we did think about that 40 years out. All the guys had great input about, okay, we anticipate having X amount of people on duty. I said, well, I don't, I don't expect us to have 40 people on duty ever in the town of North Borough. I, I just don't see that. Could I see us having 14 people on duty? I don't know. Is it possible? Sure. Because look at when we put what, what used to hold one house holds how many residences now? Right? They're either putting residences that are going up four stories or they're putting duplexes. Or right? So we have to, I, I don't know what it's going to be. Could I see us getting busier and busier? Yeah, we've been getting busier every year since I've been here. So we're just, we did design it with the idea of 50 years in the future. Okay. So that's an expansion that you have extra rooms whether it's male or female mm -hmm. firefighters, yep. to expand to 14. Uh, right, right now we can put 14 people on duty, with, so that'd be two per dorm room. That's correct. And we're trying to design the station and build the station such, and, I, and I've had this question a lot, and if I miss step here, anyone can jump in. I've heard lots of times, well, build it small and expand it when you need it. No. Well, the problem with that is multiple things. Number one, once you start building onto something, expensive. You start, it's more expensive, and you start having issues. Also, your systems, your heating systems, your AC systems, your, all of our systems within our base are all designed with that whole big building in mind. Every time you add on, now you have to go change your design to your, or add on more heating, or add on more AC. So, you know, my idea is let's build what we need now. Just like the station we've been in now, we've been in since 1974. That replaced the station that they were in for 50 years, right? So 50 years is a pretty good lifetime for a fire station. Population was a lot different. Popul so was the service. The service was significantly different, right? I can tell you, back when they built that station, they didn't take in anywhere near as emotionally distressed people as we take into the hospital now. No, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Can I have another one? Uh, I was concerned about um, has this waste mm -hmm. because you're going to have that special room to, to get the, uh, the dirt and stuff mm -hmm. smoke off the uniforms. Mm -hmm. It's going to go into special washing machines mm -hmm. to clean them good. The trucks going to come in to the bays. It's going to be cleaned and washed now. All that information. Where is that water going to go? Is it just going to go into the system as we have now? Or you're going to have a tight tank or something that can take this hazardous stuff. There's not a tight tank, I don't believe, but there's a holding. Isn't there a, a separator that they have to go through? Well, for the, for the, for the apparatus, yeah. Case, yeah, there's a there's a separator to clean some of that. And we'll be working with the engineers and, and get their recommendations. We're not quite there yet, the design, but we will talk to them about that. So there, there's a saying in the fire service, <laughs> the solution to pollution is dilution. Right? That's, that's a saying that we've had for years. So, yes, if you were to take that gear and rub it all over your face, it's not good for you. We wash that gear, it gets mixed in with the water, it goes out to the system, it gets treated out of the system, it's, it's, it's not a big issue. And so it's, it's having that carcinogen right there on the turnout gear, right there on the hose, that causes the problem. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. Hi, Amy Pretzky, 47 Indian Meadow Drive. Um, I just had a question. Um, how wide is the apparatus bay? I know the whole building is 230 feet. How wide is the apparatus we'll bay? We'll figure that out. Is me we'll measure it right on the Mark Oh, yeah. I think it's between 100 and 150 feet. Would you 
which is going to get me the right number. <laughs> My concern is, or my question is about the bifold doors. The fire station door is a bifold, which take up an extra four feet on each side, which would be eight feet total. So if you um, that's the depth of the station, that's for the width. Right? Yep, you I'm just I'm adding the width. Okay. So if you have a hundred times eight, that's uh, eight hundred square feet, right? And if, how much is it for square foot for a fire station right now? We, we really can't say until we get a cost estimate done at the end of design. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's different for every building. In like 2019, they were saying it was about $600 a square foot. And I don't know if it's more now, it's way up. But at $600 a square foot, if you add in the extra eight feet for the bifold doors, that's up to almost 500,000. So extra to have the bifold doors for the extra building. Mm -hmm. And one, another concern I have with the bifold doors is this is New England, and if you're, the front of the building is facing north. Mm -hmm. So if you have like a northeaster type of storm with wind, rain, sleet, when you're opening these doors, there's a tendency to like for the ice to build up. And I know you're gonna have heated aprons, but I just feel it's a concern in New England to have the bifold doors in case something ever got jammed up with the ice or the, I actually looked around at all the fire stations in the area, like West Bar, South Bar, Shrewsbury, and none of them had the bifold doors. Because they weren't around when they were building them. They've come in the last five, five to eight, maybe ten years. Yeah, Ashland has them. Ashland has them. We have a bunch of places that started putting them in. They open much quicker. They open in about four and a half seconds. They Unless they get stuck. They don't. They open, I know, but if they're new, we don't know. If they're new up here in New England. But that's just well, a concern not, I have. And, and, and the maintenance is much cheaper on them. And again, going by what you know, we're talking about, is that you know, if we want to put these in, it's, it's less expensive to run these doors than it is to run the overhead. All right, it's just a concern I wanted to bring up plus an added cost. And that didn't include the cost of the doors themselves. And um, did you guys look at the cow wall roof versus the roof monitors? How long? We, um, we are still looking at uh, materials and yeah. details and all. We haven't settled on any of that yet. Um, but we'll be definitely looking at different materials moving forward. Okay. One last question is um, about the grading. I did go back and watch the 2019 meeting, and everything was about how great this property was because we we're going to buy 10 Monroe, and it would be graded up, there was no need to have a wall. And then I see that picture, and there's wall on all three sides. Um, what changed between then and now? Like, is this building bigger? Is it pushed back further? Like, why do we need the retaining wall now? Um, I'll take a little bit of that. The apparatus bay is more properly sized than the equipment they had. We actually did a survey, and the other group did not have a survey. And so getting a real survey rather than using what was available without a survey made a big difference to the uh, grades. And so once we put the, the correct apron in the front, the correct depth of the apparatus space, and move it out the back, and the grades, there we go. Uh, Mark, do you have anything to add? Pretty much, yeah, and it ranges up to 30 feet high? And it's, it, yeah, and can you go back to the site? So, so okay. in this corner, it's the highest, and then it uh, slopes down over here. So it's approximately 30 feet at that point, yeah. And how far does it slope down? Is it like 5, 10 feet on the other end? I believe it's about 18 feet, 20, 20 feet in the other corner. Maybe a little bit less than that. I just can't imagine how much it's going to cost. I know there's nothing you can do at this point. But when I went back and watched that meeting, they're like, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to have to do a retaining wall, but we're lucky we don't have to do it. But now I see the picture, it goes around all three sides. So, I didn't know if there's any way to save money on the retaining wall by either making the footprint smaller or moving the building forward, which you probably can't because of the trucks. But maybe if there was a, I know there was one option that showed it would be three levels, right? Another, if that would save on the footprint size to take down the wall a little bit. It took a build, it, 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 um, it didn't work operationally, which is the most important thing for the fire department. It, from an ops point of view, it wasn't as um, best. 
Um, and then only brought the, the thing down maybe two or three feet in the back, so not significant um, amount of change to that elevation. Um, certainly not about, if we had gone down 15 feet, we'd be having a different conversation. We went to two or three feet. It didn't seem to be worth it. Um, we cannot make the apron smaller. Um, all of the trucks that make it on to the site, except the ladder truck, which is used as frequently, that will take a multiple turn, which will poke out a little bit on the West Main for a brief amount of time before it backs in. So that was, that's one thing. But if we made that apron any smaller, all the trucks would be out on West Main. So we cannot do that. So um, even if you, you know, even if you pick up two feet in the apparatus space, it's not going to move that wall. You know, it's a microscopic move at that height. What about eight feet? I don't think you're ever going to get eight feet. Well, still the doors, the doors, the doors, the doors. Back to that. Um, okay. I just want to point out that <laughs> we have code requirements um, for doors, and, and those doors do come in. There is just holes there. So we have to still maintain access around all the trucks. So you don't pick up the whole depth of that just because you might go to another head door. You're going to pick up a little bit, but you're not going to cut eight feet. I doubt that. Um, so you have to be careful here. You know, all of these dimensions, um, our code people will point those out if we miss the mark, um, just so you know, because we have done it in the past and we've been making you know, a thing by code people and saying you've got to increase the depth. You know, right. right. I heard it was actually eight feet for each side originally. No. Three feet for handicap and four feet for the doors. But if you take off the handicap part, then it's four feet part of but I, I mean, I think the other important thing is you just look at the plan, you look at the depth of the apparatus space, it, it matches the depth of the rest of the building. So even if you were to take square footage out of that, you would then need to take square footage out of the rest of the building too. That would be compromising the operations yet again in order to do that, to make this footprint even narrower, if that's what you're, you're wanting to do. Yeah, but it, he said that right now we have five 24 hour staff, and I think I'm not against the fire station. I think they need it. I think they need it for safety. It's being built for 14 firefighters, and there are five full time right now. And I'm on the um, speaking as a resident, but I'm on the planning board, and we're nearing build out. Even in 2009, John Cadier said we're at build out. You know, there's no more industrial space. The big subdivisions have been done. So, it, and they did a firefighter and police officer um, staffing review and they said five was a sweet spot. So if we're at build out to get up to 14 staff members, I mean, I feel like it would have to go three times the size of the population that we have right now. I don't know, would the whole building come down further if you built for 10 versus 14? Or is it just the dormitories? I'm just trying to save money. I mean, but I also want safety. Um, I think it's part of that because I was on the staff Yep. And five basically became the minimum of what we need. It's still not where it really should be. Um, that was in 20, that was with 2013, 2014 numbers. Based on what? It was based on, we had a, a consultant come in and spend time with the fire station, spend time with standards and reviewing what best practices are. And five was the minimum because you need, if I remember correctly, three in and two out? Two in and two out. Okay. But so, that, doesn't include the commander who's outside, but that, well, our calls have gone up tenfold since that time. Uh, I did a presentation to the yeah. select board about the call. I mention that they could done. Go ahead. Um, back just a couple of meetings ago, uh, the select board approved the town applying for a safer grant, was the, uh, the program, uh, that would add two additional firefighters per shift. So yeah. we'd be at seven with that grant, which, you know, I hope we will have in place, you know, in, in a year, year and a half. Um, and the expectation is that will become permanent. So that, that will be the standard where we are. The idea from my perspective is sometimes you end up with some need to overlap shifts, not, not on a regular basis. Um, if there's a big event going on in town, a big, a big storm, um, you, might, you might have some more folks there on a regular basis. Um, so there are seven bedrooms, seven right. more so, rooms so that, it, that can double up. Right. It's built for seven individual sleeping yeah. doors. Mm -hmm. That's what it's built for. If we find that we're expanding, we can put two people per room. But the intent really is to give individual rooms. When firefighters all sleep in a jungle, 
That's what it's called, right? All together. When one person gets sick, we can we, we had this just happen last week. And then we have all kinds of issues, right? So having individual rooms eliminates that. But we also wanted to consider in the future, if we do expand, how can we do that? And by putting the second bed in each room, that gives us the ability. Okay, so you never have to expand into the wall. Because <laughs> that would be hard. Mitch, to your point, yeah. the expectation with that grant bringing the headcount to seven, yeah. when we expect to have this go live, we would have seven. Yes. So most of oh, yeah. be before the before we go live with this That's building, right. we have seven. Yeah. How long does the grant last for? How long does the grant pay for? Three years. Three years. Three years. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a federal grant. It's by FEMA. It's 100% of a salary and any contractual benefits for 36 months. And then you'd have to pick it up into yep. the budget because you can never say, well, three years. See, I, like, I, I, yeah, I provided all that information if you went back. It's how we did it, how we would do it, how we would do that. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, Eric Martin, Vincent Terrace. <clears throat> um, quick question uh, on budgeting and costing. Can you just, and, and I don't know if I missed this, but just in design phase, and this might be typical, can you s spend one or two minutes and just explain why we don't uh, cost this out, right? Like, you know, like while we're picking the elements, like even just like a rough cost? I, I don't know if I missed that. Or, okay. Well, how do we put this? So, <laughs> We get a professional cost estimator. Costs are so um, variable and volatile in the public bid market, they're changing all the time. And so for us to throw out numbers at this point would be, I think, dangerous. It's really important to get that professional cost estimator, someone who's really tied into the markets, who understands where things are trending. Um, we get a whole engineering package together. So we, we do the, the preliminary architectural design, we send it out to our civil engineers, our structural engineers, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection. They all um, write narratives, um, describe what their systems are gonna be like, and that's all part of schematic design. So it's really the first opportunity that we get these costs. And then as we develop the design, we continue to get cost estimates moving along, but to do anything before that really would be premature. Um, we really need that body of information to really have a good feeling for what the cost of this particular building is going to be on this site with um, the, uh, the design and the systems and everything that the committee um, selects. Thank you. Um, and, and that's just, just to be clear, that that's typical. it sounds like that's pretty that's typical. Very typical. Oh, that's very typical. That's very typical. All municipal construction projects work that way. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, how, how soon are we to where are we in the process to getting that number? I mean, that would be, that's kind of a very overarching thing here, it seems to me. Right. Um, so we're still in schematic design. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I think it's at the end of this month that we send everything off to the cost yeah. estimator. And um, I can't remember the date that we get that back. Is that this month or the beginning of February? Should we we present to the committee on the 28th of February. You're scheduled right now to present. So on the 31st, we make the final study. This is the design that goes out. 31st of January. The 28th, we're currently scheduled for presentation. Um, presentation but that date may have to flex because we're having some problems getting cable coverage. So we may have to flex it. It's a so We have to flex it a day or so out. But at the end of February, we should have that number. Okay. So in you actually come to my next question, thank you, which is, are we on, so you know, we have a schedule for this. Yep. Are we on schedule with that? Yes, we are. And it, 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 assuming that we get cable coverage for, for broadcast. It, it is. It, it's, uh, I, I can tell you this. The schedule has been, I've been driving uh, the architects crazy with the schedule. It's been a, a work in progress. Um, but right now, our next, so we have this meeting. We have design meeting on the 25th. We have our next fire station uh, building committee meeting on the 31st. Then we have the next meeting scheduled is the 20th. It's, it's Thank you. When will all that data it will be available that the public wants to wait on the 28th. Some of that the 28th. The 28th is when we'll get the presentation on all that information. Because we're you're in the process of developing the budget for this year for the town meeting already. That started a month mm -hmm. ago. Then this 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 plan, this station will not be presented at this town meeting. It is scheduled. Nothing. 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 It is scheduled to go to a special town meeting. Sometime September? September, October. October. Okay. All right. So, All right. so and, and we did that, Jason, intentionally. We had originally, and if you had, we had originally targeted this town meeting. We decided we really wanted to put together a good product for the town at a decent price 
and not try and rush this and say, okay, here it is. So we intentionally pushed it out to that special town meeting for that reason. So we could actually get the architect's time, get proper pricing, get the design right, move forward in a more logical process than a let's hurry up and get it done just to get it done process. Where, where are you leaving? Are you <laughs> I, will, you I, I will most likely put my foot inside the station and then say have a good day. I, I'm done in, at the end, in the beginning of 26 probably. Oh, and that's preempting my next one. Uh, uh, where, how much life do we have left on it? How much usability? Where are we in you know, everything has you know, life With the current station? With the current station, yes, sir. So the mice are hunchback. The, the, the mice are hunchback. Very good, that's true. <laughs> the, 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 uh, the mice are hunchback. There's no room. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, it, it, it truly, uh, I'm going to tell you, we are very fortunate since the town hot hired our facilities manager. He has been on top of everything. He works. Uh, uh, Captain Brillhart is, is my uh, facilities guy, so he works directly with Captain Brillhart. Um, we troubleshoot stuff as it happens. So if anyone's wondering, you can drive by and see that big blue tarp in front of the station right now. I apologize, it's ugly. But when we get wind-driven rain, it comes through the cracks in the mortar in the front and then comes into the office and it's on the computers. So it made more sense to put an ugly tarp up than to have water come in. That will come back down, but it was up because we had uh, some anticipated bad weather. Um, do we foresee it lasting until uh, we need it? Yes. And so the guys do, these guys back here do an amazing job every day taking care of it, keeping it clean, keeping it running, got the grill hearts on top of it, and as well as our facilities manager. Um, how much runway do we have and how much, you know, you know we're, we're maintaining, but obviously that's not, you know, I, I know all you guys are doing hard work, like, we, that's not what we want to be doing, right? No, so, so as, as an example, and, and, and Captain uh, McManus came to me when we ordered our new ambulance, he said, you know, when the new ambulance gets here, we may not be able to stack the three deep because we may not have the room. Because right now, they are bumper, literally bumper to bumper. You actually have to walk across the bumper to get to the other side. We don't know yet whether or not when that new ambulance gets here, if we can fit all three inside. We may, and to store an ambulance outside is very difficult in this state because there's a lot of state requirements that say you can't do that. So then we have to find another piece of equipment that maybe we can store outside in the winter. So I think it's yeah. So we're comfortable, but it's also important to stay on track. We need to stay on track. All right. Thank you very much. Very Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Carrie Monday, 16 Hemlock Drive. So I do remember going to the earlier meetings, and I lost the storyline for a little bit, so I apologize. Um, I realized some of this, the ship was sailed, but um, just out of curiosity, you know, obviously we're up against a uh, prop two and a half override to support this. What, um, you know, we saw South Road do the public safety complex. Is, I assume that ship was sailed, number one, the public safety complex. So is there an opportunity at all? You know, you, I saw the picture of the police station come up. I drive by, I live over there, I drive by all the time at, at the speed limit, of course. But, you know, that's going to come up too. So is there a way to, like, parlay this at all, or is there a base at all for like a public safety element here where maybe there's a satellite office for the police or anything like that or that's not something that's even been talked about or considered there's no room just curious overall Any addresses to that last week? yeah so I, I can speak so during the feasibility that actually came up we talked about uh, significantly about do we want to do a public safety facility do we not want to do a public safety facility and there's some big benefits and there's some big drawbacks to public safety ask any firefighter or police officer to live together um, but there's some really good things with it. Um, it was decided at that time to not do it. We want to keep them separate. We have different needs. We need to be centrally located. We have to be. Mm -hmm. If we move that station out of the central location, we have to build a second station. Police can be located anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be located where they are. They can be located out on green. It doesn't matter because they are on the road in their cruisers, so it's a different type of thing. So I think that's why that decision was made at that time to keep it separate. You know, there's also a lot to be said about keeping your eggs separate. So keeping everything, all your public safety in, in, in one area can be good, it can also be pretty bad. Mm -hmm. If that's where your dispatch is, that's where your EOC is, that's where everything is and it goes down, now you have a problem. So there's advantages to keeping it separate as well. Chief, can I add to that? This training room you're talking about in the right corner there mm -hmm. is intended to be an emergency operations center mm -hmm. that the tables would be cleared out Police, fire, FEMA, that, that kind of the National Grid, whoever could be marshaled there. If there's an emergency in the town, this is converted to the spot, the emergency operations center. 
That's why that room exists. Got it. Okay, please answer my question. Yeah, um, if I could also add, another reason is we've, we've got a pretty good police station. Um, it obviously needs some serious exterior work, and we're going to need, that'll be in town meeting too. Okay, so um, I guess my thought was... But we, yeah. don't, we don't need another police station, and that would add substantial cost right. to this, as well as... Well, I was just wondering, like, if in two years we're going to yeah. do the police station, and we're faced with the same issue, is it best to just fight the bill? But it yeah. sounds like... I think, I think we've got this police station. It needs some TLC, but I think we've got this police station. Great, thanks for answering. Yes. Give Jay six You can't separate the emergency ambulance crew from the fire station. Would you put them in a separate location? Because all of our all of our personnel are firefighter paramedics. They're they are they are they are trained to do a lot of them all together. You can't make a separate because what happens is if right now if the crew gets a call and it's a med call, they get on the ambulance in a squad and they go. You know, right now they get a fire call, they get on the engine in the tower and they go. We don't have each piece of equipment staffed with the individuals to take it, so they, they multi-staff, they multi-task, which just depends on what the call is, what the apparatus they take. Chief, I have a question in regards to that uh, retaining wall again. Has anyone done a review of the inspection on the water tank up there, on the, on the metal? Uh, the stability of that tank and what, uh, if any, uh, emergency type of uh, uh, procedures or standards that you We're not close to the tank. How fast? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to guess. I'd have to measure it out. We're not close feet? to the tank. 100 feet? Oh, no. It's, if you look at the land, the land goes way back. And then and then there's another piece of property. Then there's the, then there's the tower. Sorry. Sorry. It's hundreds of feet. Yeah, yeah. Got of it's hundreds of feet. And now I know when we were planning here, we spoke with the DPW director about any concerns, and there were none at the time. Because he knew we were located at where we were located. Thank you. Julianne Hirsch, 19 Smith Road. So I'm looking at the size of this wall, and I'm Guessing it might be 24 feet tall? 16. 16? Doors are 7. Door 7. Door 7. 14. So 14, 16. And we're talking 29 feet? 30. 30. Oh, what's the size of the front wall for the apparatus? No, for the apparatus. No, the contained wall. Oh, the contained wall. Yeah, we're looking at a lot of things, and I don't want to speak. The architects, we're looking at a lot of things like this to soften that impact, such as terracing. So it's not, it's, we're not looking at a straight up vertical, we're looking at different aspects, different materials, lots of different things. But you think this is only 16? No. It, it, it's just, the, the walls in this room are about 24 to 28. 20, 20 to 24. Yeah. From the floor to the top. Well, if a, if a door is seven feet tall, a couple of doors are seven feet tall. That will make quite an impression. Okay, so um, it seems like 2019 this was the ideal lot. Now we've got some problems. Will the cost estimator break down the cost of the wall, the lights, the, some of the amenities? Okay, great. Um, did you, like, did you just to answer your one comment, you said it seemed that 2018 was a good lot, and now it's not. It's not true. The site's still fine. We talked about that in the last meeting. I, I didn't say it was, I, yeah. I said it was the ideal lot. <laughs> There's no such a thing. I don't think we have to trade the ideal lot because of the fact that we had trouble finding lots. So, mm. um, it was the best of what we could use to find and find. Well, I think we can all agree it's less than. It, it, it's posed some additional problems, let's put it that way. Um, the flat roof, I don't know if anybody here is remembering 2015. I'm still sort of recovering from 100 inches of snow and flat roofs caving in and that sort of thing. I'm sure that the construction is going to be amazing, but why the flat roof? When we, we know that they have to be shoveled sometimes and the climate is only getting stranger. Yeah. You know, the buildings you hear where they have trouble with the roof tend to be older buildings that aren't built to the current code 
requirements or uh, what are known as pre-engineered buildings, buildings where they really um, engineer the steel to be as minimal as it can possibly be. We're not talking about that here. This is gonna be um, factored in to take the snow loads that we need. You shouldn't need to shovel uh, a roof that has a roof that is, is designed to take the snow loads that are required by code. You know, when you put a pitched roof on an apparatus bay, it, it ends up being enormous, really very tall. You just look at the depth of that roof there. To try to put a pitched roof over that, it would be huge. And there's a lot of unnecessary volume up in that space um, once you do that. And that adds unnecessary cost as well. Um, what we are planning on doing for this roof um, is having some roof monitors, which have some glass in them and allow light to get into the apparatus space. So they'll have natural light in the depth of that building, which really enhances the operations for the firefighters. And then the monitors, they sort of look like um, a sawtooth. And the back side of that, which is gonna be facing south, is a sloped portion that we could put solar panels on as well. So that could um, you know, generate energy for the building. So um, I think, you know, we're, I think everyone was in agreement as we looked at the different options that this was really the most cost-effective uh, way to go for the building is to put a flat roof on that large apparatus bay. Okay. Um, well, that answers my question. That makes me feel a little better. Um, and just one more question. Um, as I look at the site now, there's a beautiful stone wall. There's actually a couple of stone walls. I'm hoping that we're going to incorporate that somehow in the, either the landscaping or... We can talk to the landscape architect and the civil engineer about that. We haven't talked to them about it yet, but we can take a look at them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Julia Sawell, 16 Whitney. Um, I actually have a question that has nothing to do with cost. <laughs> um, would you be willing to pull up the front elevation again? I will. My remote stopped working, so excuse me while I come over here. So while you're uh, queuing that up, my question actually is, so with the width of the building being 233 feet, um, and particularly as compared to the size of other buildings in town, it is quite imposing. And so my question was, has there been any conversation um, around maybe using different colors or different materials to perhaps break the building up visually so that the administrative side and the apparatus bay um, feel maybe less Time to talk about that. I'm not an architect, but they can tell you about that. Okay. Yeah, sorry to be interested you know, in the we had a lot. We had a lot of that discussion. We even talked about how the, the, the training tower served that purpose somewhat to break it up. And then, you can't really see, but part of that building is recessed. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, let me see if I can go to it. Now it's working. I just had to restart the PowerPoint for some reason. You know, the, the flat elevations are a little bit deceptive here because it, it looks very flat. It looks like it's a, a single plane. It's when you come and start to look at it in perspective that you see that different elements of the building are, are forward and back to try to give a little bit of visual relief. Um, you can see we have rendered it sort of in two tones of, of brick, but we're still looking at materials. The idea here is to have uh, different materials here. There's this band that kind of goes along the whole building um, and goes over this arch here, which is of one color um, that is picked up in various elements like this, uh, we call it a saddle bag, where a lot of the support spaces are um, adjacent to the apparatus bay. It's picked up again here. I'm gonna go back to the flat elevation for a minute. Um, it's picked up here in the training and hose tower. It's picked up again in the um, area to the front entrance and then all along the base of the building and these bands. That's a, intended to be a different color masonry or a different masonry product. We're still looking at uh, what that might be. Um, it looks a little bit flat here, but the idea is to try to have some of these different details that will break up the overall massing of the building. Okay, so there are still degrees of freedom in terms of the I, I went right right yours and I didn't win, so. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Lisa Maselli, 13 Maple Street. I'm with him. We should have red doors. Oh, Both those red, red and white doors. Um, and actually, I'm going to do, do design, believe it or not. You guys are taking care of the money side and the questions. I'm going to go, hey, this is very modern looking to me. 
And, um, and um, you know, I think we had, we had asked early on to try to keep everything more a traditional, you know, with maybe, maybe a Roman type of arch with a, a keystone in the top of the arch and um, maybe going into the granite. We talked about granite on the window covers and stuff like that and the arches. So we definitely talked arches. That's about the only thing I said at the last meeting. What would you like? Arches. So we come back with a, mm, maybe an arch. Eh, it's a sort of an arch. Well, it's more of an electrical. But this is modern to me. And, and we're trying to create a downtown look that's going to pull things together. So far now, nothing really goes together anymore. You've got some 80s stuff. You've got some, you know, most of the municipal buildings started modern. It's, it's modern. Every time I see a municipal building, it's modern. And, and it loses its, it loses its time element as modern. But when it's a traditional look, like everybody loves a traditional firehouse that has arches, one, two, three, four, just like our Assabet River um, bridge. And that Assabet River bridge is beautiful. And if you look at the photograph that's out there, even along the top of the um, Correa, you'll see more of the little arches going down. Um, the graves, the granites, the warmth, um, this to me is, is just very modern. Um, the windows, the, the, you know, just as I look at it, it's, I'd like to see it more in a traditional look. And I think that there should be a little bit more space above the Lord's um, North Grove Fire Department, so perhaps a, a roof that would go and give it a little bit more um, Getting away from that flat roof. I know that you're probably getting light though. That's probably what that piece is for, is for um, the light coming in. But um, but that's kind of that's kind of what I'm feeling. That this is just so modern, and um, and I'd like to be able. And I and I thought too. I mean, when we first started out, we were going to have at least two options to look at. Not color, but options. And as time went by, and a lot of people listened to the last meeting, it's no, we're not going to do that. So that's one of the bigger problems is you're going to town meeting and you're asking people to pay a lot of tax dollars for this. And it's, we absolutely need new fire. We need a lot of new buildings. This has been left to flounder for many, many decades. So when we do this and we bring it forward to people, it gives people a sense of being involved. If we do get a chance to say, well, I like A or I like B, or I like parts of A, I could go on parts of B. And I don't think that that's asking too much because right now it's all done on a computer. So I love the, the depth because you need that for people to understand what it's really going to look like. But you look at that building from the sides, very modern. Um, and and then, then you've got the, the retaining wall in the back, which is pretty significant. So. Um, we go to Hillside Grill and we see what that wall looks like today. It does not look very attractive. And with time and with water and motion and everything else, how is this wall not going to start doing that where the water keeps moving since there is a water issue up in this area? And it's been talked about in a couple of different um, um, presentations, even though we're back to 219, that there was a big discussion about the way the water comes running down in the road street and um, you're going to be disturbing a lot of land. Um, and to Amy's point, it wasn't supposed to have a retaining wall. It's supposed to be just, you know, we were, this is going to be the best location you could expand. If you had to expand this building, and even though the land goes back on the west side, how are you going to expand the building if this, you have a 30 foot retaining wall? So those are questions that, that you know, go through my mind and saying, hmm. How, you know, how are we working with that? Um, and then I guess lastly, once you start doing the retaining wall, cut that land, cut that land, we've done it with hillside, we've done it with the building next to it. Um, what happens to compromise the foundations to the houses that are on top of that hill? And I know that there was compromising going on when hillside really was built to their foundations. So uh, we financially responsible if they have to be repaired, um, how much 
how much uh, disturbance will happen once all of this starts going on into the road, not as much as it does in Robinson. And have the neighbors been brought in to even know about it or voice any concerns? So, um, so there you go. And that's what we're going to do. As far as the kind of people that's been involved in Robinson town government, and there's a lot of town meetings since I was 18 years old. 71 now. So we've never gone to town meeting with two options for people to go to. We've always gone into town meeting with a project planned. Um, we work along the way to develop what we think is the best project to bring people to town meeting. I can't imagine presenting two options for people at town meeting. Um, it's never been done. I don't know how you do it. And I don't think it should be done. I think that this committee, along with all the public input that's been um, publicized for people to come to these meetings. If the neighbors want, we can send something out for the next meeting um, so that they can come and give us input too. But um, to say that we said that there'd be two, two plans, I don't remember ever saying that the two plans submitted. Um, not in the last feasibility study or not in this study. Um, the feasibility study, what was presented was just something that was viable. It wasn't something that was really thought out. We didn't pay to have architects sit down and by using design and build it. Um, at this point in time, we're in the planning. We're designing every step of the way. We need to go to town meeting with a thought, the thoughts that have been really thought out. And as far as being best with the fire station, hopefully best with the community, um, I think the architects will work very hard to hear everything and give concerns of this committee, but also the concerns of anybody that's come forward, including our meeting, joint meetings that we've had. So, if the architects want to say anything. Um, I'm just can, I, can I mention um, how I feel this fits into uh, a regional appropriate architecture? We're using planning, design, strategies where we're expressing the different functions of the building. You have the apparatus bay, you have the hose and training tower, and you have the residential and administrative wings. And those are expressed in the architecture. It reads well from the street. You can see how the building is arranged and functioned. That's very much part of the New England design tradition that started in Boston with H.H. H. Richardson and his suburban libraries. We're using traditional vocabulary in terms of materials, brick, uh, punched windows, banding, um, mixture of both pitched roofs and flat roofs. This is all part of the New England design tradition that everybody has been speaking about. Uh, it is a contemporary building. It's an extension of tried and true traditional design methods for a specific building for a specific site. So I think what the architects have done here is a great job of blending both the functionality that the fire department needs and having it work within the regional historical styles that we all want to see. So labeling this modern, I think, is a misrepresentation. It's a contemporary building, but it's well within the design traditions of New England. And uh, I, I applaud you for the work you've done. So I have something for that. This plot is 3.8 acres. There's a significant amount of land behind the rectangle, up, up the hill from there. And because of the elevation, the steepness of that hill, that's one of the reasons why that, that wall has to be so high. Take a good look at it with another pair of eyes being drive by there and, and look at how, how high up that goes. There are no houses behind this, this property, unlike the restaurant, who's fitness, whatever, it's, whatever, it's just, just up around the corner right there. Well, they're not immediate. The monument they drive is there. But a little different layout. So all Lisa was asking for was, uh, you know, uh, a couple of different options uh, in your cost in what is the minimum needs needed uh, to facilitate to facilitate the uh, you know the functions of the fire department. Um, we're in, a, we're in an age of economic chaos here, 
expenses, and that's the only reason for looking at different options. And you don't have to bring them at the town meeting, but you better have some. You got to have a lot more uh, in hand, you know, cost-wise, to present to the public here, to the taxpayer, in order to get a good idea of what is going to happen with their property taxes, unless you're going to make some special arrangements to stop shopping that property tax back based on financial capabilities. These are all the things. We're not, we're, we're not, I'm not worried about the design of the building. Looks fine, except for the damn towel, but I understand what that, what that function is. Yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's just cost concerns. And as I said, they stated earlier, yeah. we will go to town meeting and before town meeting, well before town meeting, there's going to be costs out there. Yeah. Uh, everything will be so that you can look at it, the chief is not worry about it. But uh, we won't go in to town meeting without solid facts, solid costs, and hopefully a real good knowledge of how that, how long this is going to work. As we're designed for 50 years out. Right. Right. Anyone else? It's okay. <coughs> so, uh, Norm Corbin, uh, 35 Whitney Street. I'm only here for one reason, is the design of the building. Uh, you guys all know what you need. And I have to agree with Lisa. When I look at the right side of that building, those, those the windows, just the windows, do look modern. And I, I guess I would have liked to see the windows look a little bit more old New England. I live in an old antique, and I, I guess in this one sense, I'd like to see that kind of windows. Um, but you know, everything else you're doing, I, I really applaud what you've done. There's a minor point, I guess, but uh, I just think the windows look a little modern. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Tom, I'm sorry, I'm not agreeing. No, I, I'd like the, the architects to speak to the witness, because I can tell you, we've talked about this. We, we have looked at uh, lots of different window patterns. As we said, we're still in schematic design. There's still room to be making adjustments and changes. Um, one of the challenges that we have, too, is the energy code. There's a new energy code in Massachusetts. Um, so we're doing a lot of research into what it's going to mean to meet that energy code, what type of window, what material it's going to be, how they're going to operate. All that needs to be investigated and, and um, worked through as we're doing um, energy modeling, that's one of the next things that we need to do with our HVAC engineer, our mechanical engineer, is they take the preliminary design that we've done and they put all different parameters into a computer system, including how we're building the walls, the insulation values, the windows, the roof, everything along with their mechanical system to see if we're going to meet the energy code. So there's still time to make adjustments and probably will be adjustments. This isn't the last, the last iteration that you're going to see. That's all I'm asking for. And I live maybe a five minute walk from that, so you know I, you know, I I've never seen it a lot. So thank you. My name is John Bourgeois, 52 Washburn Street. I just wanted to ask, in terms of the uh, pitched roof themselves, what materials are you proposing to use? Asphalt shingles, steel. You know, obviously in the window, my preference would be to have steel on that roof as opposed to asphalt, but... For the, for the actual cladding material? Yeah. yeah, I think we will be, um, you know, talking with the cost estimator and looking at prices for asphalt shingle for, uh, and for metal roofing to sort of see where, what we can afford and what makes sense. Certainly there is a longevity um, difference between the two of them. The metal roofing product will last a lot longer than the yeah, asphalt absolutely. shingle. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's, I, at least in my mind, it's worth the investment up front to go down that path as opposed to replacing a roof every 20 years, give or take, or if there's a strong storm, the shingles are popping up. Additionally, I did know um, last meeting and several meetings, we've talked about the potential for adding solar to the roofs. I know, uh, I think Algonquin's done that now. We're talking about doing that with other schools. Um, I, I really would think this makes sense. You have such a large space, such a large footprint, that adding solar, one, would make that kind of a net zero impact to the, the building itself, but also could be producing enough energy to send it back to national grid. I have solar in my house. I pay nothing for electricity, um, and I actually make money on it. And I would think, you know, it's something that 
the town should consider for this building, any building that we build going forward, whether it's solar, wind, or what have you, and to build on that, in terms of the mechanisms within the building, the heating systems, I assume we are going after the best that we get in terms of energy efficiency, et cetera. So. Um, so as far as the PV solar is concerned, the energy code actually requires us to design the roof to be solar ready. Right. So no matter what, we will be designing the roof to be solar ready. And then um, the question of whether or not we can afford to put the panels on now, I think it would be great. We can certainly look at that. Um, the um, HVAC um, or mechanical systems, uh, we did have the mechanical engineer met with the building committee, talked about what types of systems they typically see in buildings like this. Um, we talked about the pros and cons. The next step is to do what's called a life cycle cost assessment. So they um, put together uh, a narrative for the cost estimator to compare the cost of these different systems. And they run some models once they get preliminary design from us and put it into that computer model that I was talking about. They can then run some models to see what the overall energy use would be on the building. And so they can compare what the upfront cost is to the um, to the operations cost of running that system, and we can make a decision on the life cycle cost and what makes the most sense for the town. Okay. And as a <clears throat> prior student of Wentworth Institute in Boston, mm -hmm. architectural engineering, uh, I think the design's great. I really do like design. I think it's uh, it does represent the room, the old brick, the tower, the lush tower. <coughs> um, I think it makes sense. Um, obviously, it's never perfect, it never will be, but I think in terms of what we're looking for in town, I think it's going to be a nice centerpiece. Um, I guess the other thing I would ask or question, as it relates to um, the town's um, strategy, in terms of the overall strategy of the town, you know, we've talked about doing some different things with the town hall, the old fire station, etc. Um, have we thought about how this plays into that overall strategy, or are we, or are we having those conversations at all? Um, so I'd just like to think about that. Maybe the landscape and maybe something, sidewalks, extending the sidewalks down beyond, you know, the restaurant down the street there and the banks maybe, um, doing something to that effect. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there as well. Thank you. I have one other item, but this pre I want to make sure we're all done with the presentation. Okay, so the two things I mentioned. One is the 28. That's, uh, I talked to Dan extensively. I twisted his arm. I hit him with a bat. I cannot get him to fudge off the 28 not being a good date. He just doesn't have the bandwidth to, to put someone here to, or anywhere, to broadcast the meeting. So we either go... We either don't broadcast the meeting in the channel or we change the date. Do we have to vote? Would you be able to cover that? Uh, we would have to have, have to run three votes. Actually, I can run three votes. That's easy. But that's that's, that's true. That's up, up, up to the chair and the rest of the body if you're to do that. And your architect is, I mean, uh, um, a virtual meeting on the 20th, I think that would be fine. Oh, okay. I may have done one or two of that. Yes, yes, yes. You do have some experience. Come to the station and hang out. All right. So, I agree with you. Yeah. 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 That allows us to just stay on schedule. I'm perfectly okay with that. I just wanted to make sure that that point was brought out. And the only other thing is, we talked about, we talked about putting a sign up on the property there. And, uh, I talked a lot to, I spoke with the architect and I asked him, I said, well, do you know when you're going to sign up for the rendering on it? And the response was, that gets done when the fence goes up and they start the construction. I mean, really know what it's going to be. But we wanted to, we wanted to be able to find a way to get in, more information out there to get people more involved. So I, I came up with a simple design about how to stop the out. And, excuse me, God, what did I get off? Yeah. yeah. So all this is, is a simple 
looking at uh, making it like a banner. You can have a crown trophy or something to make a banner. Uh, QR code takes you directly to uh, the, fire, the uh, fire station project page off the fire department page, which has links to all the different presentations. As soon as I, when I get this presentation, I'll put the link off of it, schedule meetings, pictures. Uh, and also, I have the URL down there. Which I try to get it short, but I can't get it shorter. So I, could, I might be able to. Yeah, and, yeah I, I don't have it. I can do the QR code, but yes. you know, I'm not the best. And the idea was to, just to create this and get, it, get a sign up here sooner than later. So someone can say, hey, I didn't realize there was a web page I could go to information. They can scan the QR or, or, or actually, even if you don't have the QR code, you go to the fire department uh, web page and there's a thing that says fire station project. And you just click on that, it's got all the information in there. Madam Chair, I'd like to add a copy for the next committee meeting on what I call Project Awareness Marketing Campaign for discussion of things like this. I'll make sure it's on the Thank you. So, what would you like you guys, what would you want, what do you guys want me to do with it? Okay. So Mitch, how, how, how soon do you think you can check? Tonight. Yeah, just drop me an email. We can get that. I'll reach out. I'll take care of it. I'll get it produced. I'll get it put out. I'm concerned about having a QR code. Like I'm worried about people driving by and trying to trying to do something. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's helpful if we could just have it be like NorthRoadFire.com. Yeah, we, we, we changed like we changed the wording more times. I had yeah. to definitely yeah, have to look at it. How can, how can we make it friendly but easy for them? Because like I said, go to the North Pearl Fire Station website. They click on that. Yeah, that's too much for Related, we should talk about this a little bit. It would be really, really helpful to at least myself as a member of this committee, probably to the public, that after we get a presentation at one of these meetings, that that night, the next day, the same files that we saw. Okay, you mailed it out to everybody. She, she, she sent it to me and I, I sent it to the body. Okay, Did you not get one, it? The one from the last meeting. Yep. I, I, look. I haven't seen it. And, and they're also not on the website. Least, as far as they're on the website. There's, okay. a, there's a link that says click here for that from the last meeting. And you can click on it and book them off. Okay. Uh, but I'll check. Maybe I messed up your email when I send it out. Let me check. If not, I'll, tomorrow morning I'll send it out again to everybody. No. I very well did. Yeah. No, yeah, but I, I specifically asked them to so send it to me as soon as you can, so I can then send it out to the body. And then I, I load it, I upload it to our website. The, the last several presentations should be there. It's past meetings. It's past right. meetings. All right. Down below the comments. Chief, uh, are we all good on the contaminated soils? Have we got all of the oil and Yes, that, so yeah, that, 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 that's a great. I thought there was something. Yeah, no. So, in, in fact, I was asked that question, and I, I provided the information to the town administrator. Uh, when we, before we closed, we would not close on the property at all until we had this final solution that was approved by the DEP, the RLS, RLSD, and the Sellers LSD. That was all done, closed, cleaned. Did we did. We had. Test wells that ran for two full quarters that were clean. In fact, DEP said you can pull the test wells, you don't need them anymore. Okay. Yep, so they were removed. So we're all set on that. Yep, it's all been done. And you're going to be getting new administrative uh, quick testing stuff and new important. Well, that's all part of the process. Yeah, that's all part of that. Appreciate <laughs> So moved. Appreciate it. Right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.